Hi, thank you all for coming um, to our Public Interest Week event. This event is co-sponsored by LCS and NLG. Um, and thank you to TPIC, the law school, for having us. Um, we are so grateful to our fantastic panelists. Um, this is going to be a great conversation. And our 1L moderator, Yasmin Segur, is passionate about movement lawyering and is going to ask some great questions. Um, we have an hour of discussion, and then we'll have some opportunity for Q&A as well. Um, hi, everyone. I'm Yasmin. Um, I'll be moderating this discussion with these wonderful panelists. Um, first, we have Jackie Curran, who is on Zoom here. She's a staff attorney with the Abolitionist Law Center. Her work at the Abolitionist Law Center focuses on pursuing claims against the Allegheny County Jail for its unconstitutional treatment of incarcerated people. Curran also works on prison-related referenda and is currently litigating a case in Lackawanna County to ensure that residents can vote on a referendum to ban solitary confinement at the local jail. Um, Inez Bordeaux um, joined our city defenders based in St. Louis, Missouri in July of 2019 as the manager of community collaborations. Inez was first introduced to ACD in 2013 when she was going through a challenging time and was targeted by the racist criminal legal system. In her current role, Inez works with partner organizations, advocacy groups, organizers, and activists to build relationships that allow ACD to reach common goals of community well-being. Miriam Nemeth worked until last week at the Advancement Project uh, as the Director of Litigation in December. She will join the Human Rights Defense Center as their Litigation Director and General Counsel to continue her work with individuals experiencing incarceration. She is a Penn Law alum, class of 2009, and currently lives in D.C. So the first question is for all three of our panelists. Um, and I just kind of wanted to ask what your understanding of movement lawyering is and how you came to this work. Um, so whoever wants to go first. OK, Jackie. <laughs> yes, the eye in the sky for today. Uh, so uh, my definition of movement lawyering is working with uh, directly impacted people with, to not only identify the problem, but to work towards uh, a solution and, and recognizing that that solution might not necessarily be through litigation, that it can be uh, pursued through administrative agencies, oversight bodies, um, through the media, that there are a lot of tools in the toolbox and that we use them with the people who have been affected. Uh, I came to this work uh, because I think it started more of a passion for civil rights when I was very young. Uh, my parents tried to integrate the school district that I was in, and that had a lifelong impact on me. And in terms of looking at people who don't have a voice in our society, that, that for me, I think that has a lot to do with people who are incarcerated and their families. And through there, I went to go get more specialization in prison law, and then this job at the, with the Abolitionist Law Center came up, and I've been there ever since. Okay, that's fine. Hi, y'all. My name is Inez Bordeaux. I use she, her pronouns. Um, movement lawyering to me as an organizer is really just using your powers for good instead of evil. Um, knowing where to put the whereas and the how to's and the thereas in a legal document, I consider that kind of a superpower. Um, and so using that power for the good of marginalized communities, for those who have been discriminated against or being actively oppressed, um, is really what movement lawyering is to me. Um, also understanding that the law will not and cannot save us and understanding that law is a tool, one of the many tools and a very large toolbox we have to achieve liberation um, for all peoples is what movement lawyering is to me. All right, guys, we're going to see if ooh, that tech works. Um, hey, everyone. It's great to see all of you here. Uh, this was not a topic that was talked about at all when I was at Penn many years ago. Um, so I'm excited to see that you guys are here and are interested in it. Um, and I hope this is a great discussion. 
Um, movement, I second um, everything that Jackie and Inez said about movement lawyering. I think Advancement Project, the place I was just recently at, specific model talks about um, leadership from directly impacted people and lawyers taking a step back to support and provide tools and skills to, to the individuals who are directly impacted and the communities that are directly impacted. Um, we also really focused on building power in those communities, thinking about not just making one small legal change, but like <clears throat> how do we build, how do we create a base from which change can really happen? So you're not you know, just parachuting in, having one victory and then leaving, but you're figuring out who the leaders are, you're helping them become leaders, you're training them up on skills, um, you know, you're supporting their development so that when you do step away, even, step even farther back, they can take it and run with it. Um, and I think that those are really important ethos. It's you know, plugging into the movements and into the leaders in the community and not coming in and deciding what the change needs to look like for our community. Um, how did I get into movement lawyering? Um, kind of by accident. So I, probably of the three of us on this panel, lacked a real knowledge of, of abolition, of movement lawyering, of all of those things until I started at Advancement Project. Um, I was really interested in getting out from behind a desk where I had litigated for a decade and didn't like it at the time, um, and, be, and finding a way to work with people and communities more, and that just kind of naturally fit with the movement lawyering model. Um, and over the past few years, I've spent a lot of time educating myself and reading political education about movement lawyering, about white privilege, about abolition, about you know, our criminal legal system, um, and you know, believe in the importance of, of work directed in a certain avenue. Um, a lot of that grew out of my real interest in being involved in, the criminal, in fighting the criminal legal system. I've always had kind of views that, that the system was horrible and, and treated people terribly. Um, and I was going to do a shout out, but Marco isn't here. Um, so two of the people who um, are the reason that I do prison work actually were able to join today. Uh, my friend Theophilus and um, our friend Marco, who will be back there at some point, who I worked with when I was at Penn. Theophilus likes to say that we all went to law school together because we, I helped to run the Prisoner's Legal Education Project and worked with Theo and Marco um, in there. And they taught me so much about what it means to think about the law and to work with people and to care about these issues. Uh, and there's Marco. Um, I just shouted you out. Oh. So these two, these two guys are some of the reason that, are one of some of the main reasons that I do the work that I do and that I care so much about it. Um, you know, getting to know them. And so experiences in law school can, can change your trajectory and I encourage you guys to really keep an open mind about um, that and push your own boundaries while you're here. I forgot to say what got me involved in the work. I am not a lawyer. Um, I can play one on TV. Everything I know about the law, I learned pretty much from Jack McCoy on Law and Order. But then I realized that it's propaganda and I have to stop watching it. So I did. But I am a directly impacted person. Um, actually, I'm a nurse. I've been a nurse for 16 years. Um, I live in St. Louis. I was prosecuted by the state of Missouri for a crime, um, or I was prosecuted under a statute that the state of Missouri ruled, or the Missouri Supreme Court ruled unconstitutional in 2016. Um, I lost seven years of my life to the criminal legal system. Um, I'm a petty Scorpio, like super petty. I'm gonna get my lick back. So um, the state of Missouri took something from me. It took many years for me, um, time with my children, educational opportunities, job opportunities, just living and thriving. And because I'm the petty individual I am, like I said, I'm gonna get my lick back. So in 2017, when my felony, um, my felony was vacated, I think that's the right term. When my felony was vacated, I like, very cliche-like in a movie was like, I vowed to dedicate the rest of my life to tearing down the systems that tried to destroy me. Um, and I meant it. So here I am five years later, still working as an organizer, still working to dismantle um, the criminal legal system as we currently see it. I, <clears throat> excuse me, 
I specifically do abolition-related organizing. So my job at Arch City Defenders is to defund the police, to close jails, to you know get rid of white supremacy and racism in St. Louis. Amazing. Thank you all for sharing. Um, and as especially thank you for sharing um, your story. Um, and I think, um, Miriam, you touched on this a little bit um, in terms of um, working directly with impacted communities. Um, and I guess, you know, there there's definitely a lot of um, power and privilege that you bring into a space where there are social movements being led by directly impacted communities. So how do you navigate those things? How do you navigate um, your power and privilege in those spaces? This is specifically for Jackie and Miriam. Jackie, do you want to go or do you want me to go? No, why don't you start? Cool. Um, this is the big one. I think this is a really big one coming from a major law school where you're taught to or, and or surrounded by people who have innate blind confidence and a real ego and attitude about what they can do and what they bring to a situation. Um, that is not the way that you can approach movement spaces and, and community groups and directly impacted folks. You are not a god coming down from above to bestow your legal knowledge. Uh, and it is a real frame shift from what you learn in law school and what you're like, you know, as you guys are, as like, you, you know, people in your class will be like, oh, I got into this, I'm going to this law firm and I'm going to this law firm, no one cares. Um, okay, we care a little bit, but um, in the movement space like that doesn't matter and you need to really be cognizant of how much space you're taking up, um, how much time you're talking, who's doing the talking and who's doing the listening and, and where are the ideas coming from. I regu regularly, uh, I'm a lawyer so I like to hear myself speak, um, and I regularly have to remind myself that the things that are coming out of my mouth are not going to be the most interesting thing in the room or the most important thing that someone says and that I'm gonna get a lot more by listening than I am by talking. Um, and so I spent a lot of time over the last few years like dialing it back and, and trying to take up less space and um, you know, kind of unlearn some of the lessons you learn in law school about the space that you're supposed to take up and how important it is for you to talk about your work. Um, that's probably a good summary, but also happy to delve more into this if, if folks are interested. Yeah, I'm, I'm just going to echo what was just said. It's remembering to be humble and, be, and being a very good listener. It sounds cliche, but information is not the same. It's not mean knowledge, and knowledge does not mean wisdom. Some of that will come over time, but in this space, you, it's a necessity to be listening to people who both are directly impacted, and at ALC, we have people who are organizers. If I'm doing anything related to litigation, that's us, or that we want to um, go in front of an oversight board, I'm always talking with our organizers, the people who also are, who are advocates. It's, it's not... As was just said, it is not a God on high, and this is how, dictating how it's going to be. It's a, it really is, should be the reverse, if anything, is you are there to listen and then apply your legal knowledge to be supportive and, and give them your advice, your genuine advice. I think the other thing is to keep in mind, and um, one of our people who was in charge of organizing came up with this um, phrase, is not to be a trauma vulture. <laughs> the idea is that so, if someone else is like suffering or experiencing pain, it, we are not there to then swoop in, take that pain in order to pursue some type of cause it, that is just totally disconnected from the people who are actually experiencing it. So that, that's what I would, that's my reflection. Thank you to you both. Um, and this leads directly into a um, question for Inez, um, I think both of them touched on um, behaviors, practices that they've found helpful as attorneys, but I guess from your perspective, what are some behaviors or practices of lawyers that um, you've worked with that you, you found particularly helpful um, or beneficial in social movement spaces, and what about behaviors or practices that were unhelpful or potentially harmful? 
Yeah. Um, I think Jacqueline and Miriam really touched on the big things, which is not parachuting in, thinking that you're going to be the one to save these people or this neighborhood or whatever, this subset of people who have this issue. Um, I think that's number one, and I think that applies for everyone who wants to participate in movement work. Um, I'm sure you all have heard, like, the people closest to the problem are the ones who have the answers to that problem, so you should be listening to those folks. Um, in my experience, some of the most helpful behaviors that lawyers have exhibited to me was really just listening as like a directly impacted person, as a person who was struggling in the criminal legal system. Sometimes I showed up at MJ's office. MJ is one of the founders of Arch City Defenders. He is like my lawyer. Um, and sometimes I would just show up at his office and cry in frustration about me not being able to navigate my way out of the system that I was stuck in. So those times when I would show up, God bless MJ, he's a saint. Um, those times that I would just show up at MJ's office unannounced with no appointment, tearful, almost hysterical, frustrated, and he would stop whatever he was doing and be like, come sit down in my office and he would close the door and I would just talk and cry. And I told you all I used to watch Law and & Order. And so I had like these crazy ideas on how I was gonna get my felony vacated, like these different strategies that we could try. And he always listened. He never laughed at me or told me I was being ridiculous. He would just sit there and he would listen. And after I was done talking and crying and cursing and raging, he would sit me back down and he would say, okay, now, Inez, let me explain to you how the law actually works. Um, and that was important for me to hear, but that 30, 40 minutes that he spent just listening to me talk about what I was going through, like, it was really a balm that helped soothe some of those super raw nerve endings I had around the issue. And it really just made me love him all the more. But that listening was so very important. It really held me over in those, in those rough moments. Um, and then, like I said, the behaviors that I have seen is, again, parachuting into a situation, thinking the law is going to fix it, letting people, the directly impacted people that you're working with, allowing them to think that the law is going to fix everything and all the ills in their life, um, I have found incredibly unhelpful. Inez's um, comments actually reminded me of a few things I forgot to say. Um, thank you for that. I, um, as she kind of pointed out in her story, all of this work moves, as people say, at the speed of trust. So one thing that's really hard and that you need to reprogram as a lawyer is, like, we're so used to being like, here's the deadline, we, we must meet it. Um, whether it's a campaign, whether it's a court deadline, anything. Some would argue that courts and the law are all made up and do what they want anyways. Um, which is, you know, kind of true. Most of the A position I'm not unsympathetic to um, at all. But you know, we're so used to being like, no, it just has to get done by now because that's how you're trained to behave in law school. That is not how this work works. And you destroy relationships when you put a deadline before the relationship and the trust and, and building a space with someone where you see each other as humans. And so it's really, it, and that. I am like a massive type A, like I write lists, I have notes for everything, I'm super prepared, I read all the questions on the train and thought through all my answers and then of course forgot them, so good job. Um, and it's really hard to step back from that, at, like from what you're, like what's drilled into you from like decades of schooling and, and take things at a different pace and recognize that like maybe something's just not gonna get done that week and that's okay. And the other thing that's really important to retrain yourself is that as a law student, you're taught to say no, basically. 
no, this doesn't work here, no, we can't do that, here's the risk you have to worry about, here's this problem, here's that problem. When you're a lawyer in a movement space, your role is not to, to, tell, to tell people what they can and cannot do. Um, your job is to use the law as a tool to find a path that will work. And also to you know, advise, like, maybe you don't want to do this civil disobedience because that will mean that you guys are in jail for three days and that will disrupt your ability to move the campaign this way. But if you want to, here's how we can set up these resources to help you. We'll connect you with this criminal defense lawyer. We'll make sure you're well fed before you go in. We'll make sure that we have a list of the medication you need, your emergency contacts, so that we can help make sure you're safe inside. Um, but so often lawyers come into these spaces and it's like, oh no, that's not the best path, that's not advisable. A lot of people who are working in movement spaces are not trying to take the super legal route. They're trying to, <coughs> to raise some, some hackles and get attention and you want to find the, you want to figure out which the, where the pressure points are and how you can keep people safe and what's the path to yes. I hope we get to talk more about that how more lawyers should say yes. Um, I know, I mean, with a lot of things, everything comes down to did we win or did we lose? It's a zero-sum game and all of that. No, in movement lawyering, it's not a win or lose thing. Sometimes, and I can only speak from what I've seen from the last almost four years that I've been at Arch City, sometimes we file lawsuits that we know we are going to lose. Sometimes we do that. The point isn't that we're trying to win this lawsuit. Like, yes, we're trying to win the lawsuit, but the point is we are putting the state, we are putting St. Louis Metropolitan Police Department, we are putting Maplewood, we are putting uh, Normandy, we are putting Ferguson on notice that we see what you are doing and we are not going to stand for it and the community is not going to stand for it. For it. Even if it takes us six years to get through a lawsuit, even if we lose the first round and we're going to go back and appeal, say yes. Say yes. Say yes to the crazy things, to the outlandish things. MJ should have been saying yes to some of my crazy law and order themed harebrained schemes to get my felony vacated. You know what I'm saying? So, like, I think it's important to say yes because it lets the foundation, it sets the foundation for what you're going to do moving forward. It lets the community know. Is this a safe person space? Can I curse here? It lets the community know, like, we're not going to take your shit anymore. And, again, it's an additional tool that can be used in addition to the organizing and the different tools in the toolbox that we're working with. Yeah, and Inez um, raised another point that you really need to reframe what a win is. A win isn't necessarily winning that court case. A win is now everyone in the community knows that that defendant is a bad actor, or now everyone in the community is paying attention to how bad that jail is, and people are, are, are coming out and base building and going to the city council and being like, why is this happening? Why is why have 59 people died in the Baton Rouge jail in the past X number of years? Um, you know, so it's like reframing what it means to win. And sometimes what it means to win is that a community member got the courage to get up in front of a court and testify to the situation her son is dealing with because he couldn't make bail and is being detained in jail simply because they didn't have the money for him to be free. And for her to panic all morning be so concerned about her ability to speak in public in court, stand up, do it, and give beautiful testimony and realize how strong of a person she is and what she offers to this fight and how important her voice is, that is a win. We settled that case and we, I consider that a big win, but also that is a win. Um, getting someone, sometimes getting someone to call you back. When we um, brought a COVID case in jail, just getting connected to that first plaintiff who was locked down in a condemned solitary confinement line that was a huge win. That was like you know, going, getting a jail inspection and going down there and seeing everyone and having them realize that there are people outside who give a fuck about them. I um, love cursing. I curse a lot. I'm really holding back right now. Y'all don't even understand. Um, like th those are wins. All of those things are wins, and you shouldn't just 
evaluate your work by did I, what's my case ratio? Did I win or lose? That's not, did I, did I create space for someone? Did I help build power? Did I leave this community better than, than I entered it? Those are some of the wins you guys should think about. Um, Jackie, I don't know if you have anything more since we've been yammering on for a while. Uh, yeah, I, I, think, I think you guys kind of covered uh, everything. The only thing I, I would add is to also remember often the people that we work with. When we say it's, it's not that they're just directly impacted by a, a certain firm. It, they're people and communities that have years of trauma that they can be dealing with or also can have PTSD, have any uh, some type of psychiatric disability, uh, m medical disability, substance abuse disorder. And so when we also like look, we define what is a win, it's incredible that you just, these people are, or whoever it may be, is able to, to come forward and to speak up or participate in whatever way that is. That was, that's the only thing I have to add. Amazing, thank you all. Um, all of you touched on this, um, especially Miriam and Inez, um, where you talked about like specific, um, you know, instances in which um, you, you worked with activists, Inez, where you worked with um, Lawyers, um, can you all sort of touch on specific instances um, where a partnership with between attorneys and activists and communities was successful um, and what kinds of things made it successful? Um, on top of that, any instances where maybe things didn't work out the way that you wanted them to? and why those partnerships weren't weren't successful and however you would define that. Yes, I'm afraid I'll take all the time if I talk about CTW. Um, CTW is the Close to the Workhouse campaign. The Workhouse is a jail in St. Louis. Its official name is MSI, Medium Security Institute. The Workhouse has been around in one form or another for about 150 years. It's called the Workhouse because originally it was literally built on a limestone quarry. So if you were accused of a crime or you had a debt, they would send you to the Workhouse. You would break up rocks to pay off your debt. Um, people have been calling for the closure of the Workhouse since it first opened in like 1860-something. Um, it's a really horrible place. It's infested with rats and roaches. It's got black mold growing on the walls. There's asbestos in the boilers. There's no air conditioning. There's very little heat. Um, half the toilets don't flush. Half the showers don't work. The food is really, really bad. It's built on a landfill. Like I could go on and on and on and on. In 2017, we did the Black Mama bailout. Well, Action St. Louis did the Black Mama, Mama bailout, where we bailed out a whole bunch of Black Mamas for Mother's Day. And the stories that we were hearing coming from the women that were coming out of the workhouse were like especially deplorable. If you are black in St. Louis, you've either been to the workhouse or you know someone who's, who has been to the workhouse. So we had all heard the stories, but many people just like myself thought there's no way in the 21st century in the richest country in the world in a major metropolitan city that we are holding people in these type of conditions. Turns out, reader, guess what? We were holding the people in those type of conditions. Every single thing I just told you about the workhouse is not what someone else has told me. This is what I've seen with my own eyes. Um, I was in the workhouse in 2016 for 30 days. That was actually the thing that radicalized me. Um, so in 2017, we heard all of these terrible stories. Arch City Defenders, was AP in on that lawsuit? No, because Thomas didn't start at AP until 20. Okay. Um, well, in 2017, um, Arch City Defenders filed a federal lawsuit against the city of St. Louis for its inhumane, unconstitutional conditions of the workhouse. This was in 2017. The campaign to close the workhouse started in 2018. 
Um, there's a whole bunch that happened, and I don't want to monopolize the time, but there is an inside. Say that again. Yes, there was an inside-outside strategy for getting the workhouse closed. Our city defenders filed the lawsuit. We started a campaign. We had many organizers. Myself was one of them. Um, and the inside-outside strategy really did work. The outside strategy of the organizers was really just to raise awareness of what was happening inside of the workhouse to let people know that things that you've heard about this jail, they're not made up, they're not exaggerated, they are really real. And so we introduced the city of St. Louis to a lot of impacted people and had them tell their stories. One of the things that allows the, that allowed the workhouse to exist, to thrive, to breathe was cash bail. Almost every single person inside of the workhouse, they hadn't been committed. It, the workhouse is a medium security jail. So if you are in the workhouse, you're not a threat to society. You're just poor and probably black. And so you were too poor to be able to afford your bail. St. Louis City was setting people really, really high bails, $50,000, $75,000, $100,000. Um, for bail and cash bail is what allowed the workhouse to thrive. So our inside outside strategy was we're going to file this lawsuit against the jail for the conditions. We're going to have organizers on the ground. In 2020, we filed a federal lawsuit against the city of St. Louis for its unconstitutional bail practices. And so between the organizing that was happening on the outside, getting not just impacted people, but people of the city of St. Louis, politically educated, civically engaged, in conjunction with the multitude of lawsuits that we filed resulted in 2020, the Board of Aldermen, which is like our city council, the Board of Aldermen voted to close the workhouse. And then they backtracked on it. And then we elected a mayor who was like, hell yeah, we should close the workhouse. So when she was elected in 2021, she zeroed out the workhouse. And on June, Juneteenth weekend that in 2021, she emptied out the workhouse. And it's been pretty much empty ever since. And I missed a whole lot of steps, but please go to closetheworkhouse.org and you can read all up on what we've been doing, all the details that I had to leave out for the sake of time. But the point is we had an inside outside strategy. We used the law to cudgel them from the outside and then the organizers were organizing the people of St. Louis. It got so serious that in 2021, every single person that was running for elected office, it didn't matter, comptroller, recorder of deeds, mayor, alder person, the number one question that everyone was asked, there's two really, where do you stand on closing the workhouse and where do you stand on re-envisioning public safety? We had created such a groundswell of support of asking the city of St. Louis. We spend $16 million on the workhouse every year. What could that $16 million do in your community? What does your neighborhood need? Asking folks to freedom dream. What do you wanna see that money get spent on? So in 2021, we had created such a groundswell that it was undeniable, that there wasn't a single elected official in St. Louis who could get away from the question, where do you stand on closing the workhouse? And I'm sitting here on whatever today's date is, November 16th, it's my mom's birthday, I did call her. I remember to call her this morning. November 16th, the workhouse has been empty for quite a while. We are simply waiting on repairs in the other jail to be completed and the workhouse will be closed like forever. I think it, that is a great example of how organizing and lawyering and movement lawyering go together. We did all of the things that Miriam and Jacqueline talked about, putting impacted people first, having impacted people lead the movement. I haven't always worked at Arch City. Like I said, I'm a nurse, I've been a nurse for 16 years. 
MJ called me and was like, hey, we're starting a campaign to close the workhouse. Are you in? I was like, hell yeah, I'm in. And so we did that time and time and time again. Impacted people, black, poor, directly impacted people, led the movement. Our voices were the ones in the front. Lawyers listened to everything we said every step of the way. And when you tie it all together, you can shut down a jail. And you're a hellhole jail in your city if you use that same kind of... um, Equation impacted people plus movement lawyering plus organizing plus protesting plus rallies plus phone banking plus showing up at elected officials' house, filing another lawsuit, appealing another lawsuit, ending cash bail in St. Louis City as it had for decades been operating. And when you combine all of those things together, like I said, you can shut down a jail. That um, project, we were really fortunate to have fantastic organizers like Inez and um, a number of groups, and Jay and Jay, Hudson, yeah. um, a number of groups who were really invested in that work. Um, we tried to do similar work in Baton Rouge, uh, and the, it is really hard to merit. It is a, a, one the thing that's important to think about is like when do you actually bring litigation? And when can your can that be helpful as opposed to just a distraction? Um, and those are tough questions that, that change in each circumstance. And I'd mentioned our bail case in Baton Rouge, which I think is a huge success, but I think it could have been even more of a success if we had been able to um, incorporate organizing more um, than we had. And I think the group we worked with was just younger. Um, you know, we, we were able to do really important things, like before we went into settlement talks. We filed this case against the judges. The judges immediately asked to settle. Um, we spent a year in settlement talks. But um, as we, oh, it was misery. Um, they're not, they're not good lawyers or nice people. Um, we brought our settlement proposal to the organizing group and to the community and said, how does this look? What do you guys think? We were able to get, you know, this is a priority, this is not a priority. Um, this would be a wish thing. Don't forget to ask about this thing, and that was really important. And our group did a you know rallies around different important court events, but it just wasn't as symbiotic of a moving on all fronts thing. Um, and maybe you know, we got a great settlement that I'm super happy with. Um, that hopefully will build power in that community. But maybe that wasn't the right move at that moment. Uh, maybe we should have been investing more resources in building the community up or in, re- in a community group or really thinking about more intentionally how we use litigation to base build in that group. Like that may have been a better use of our time. And it was hard because we went through <coughs> settlement talks and so there weren't public events. Um, you know, and litigation can last a lot longer than, than the community cares about it. So there, it's... You can have major, major wins, but it is a long battle. Um, And sometimes thinking through, is this the right legal tool at this moment for this group in this community, is a tough call. Um, And sometimes doesn't always work out as as well as you would want. Um, Do I regret what we did? Absolutely not. I think we did great work. Um, We got a great settlement. The community is super happy with it. Um, But there are probably different ways that we could have showed up. Even, even more long-term success, or built in more long-term success from the beginning. And we're still doing some of that now. The workhouse lawsuit still hasn't settled. I have a feeling that the jail will actually be officially closed before the lawsuit actually settles. I know that we did settle, we tried to do settlement talks a couple of months ago, and we just couldn't come to an agreement. Um, It's a class action lawsuit. So there's a lot of folks in who have like skin in the game. Um, But we weren't able to come to a settlement. So I think we're going to trial next year. I hope they call me to testify. I want to testify. Um, (laughs) And if not, like, I just want my $33 or whatever I'm going to get from the class action lawsuit. But I think there's a very good chance that this jail could actually close before the lawsuit gets finished. 
That's the important of importance of leading with organizing and not litigating and finding a way to fit the litigation <coughs> into the campaign as opposed to the campaign into the litigation. It's hard to follow that act, but I will try my best. <laughs> um, so my examples come from our uh, jail in Allegheny County, Allegheny County Jail or ACJ. And just to start with some of the background of the jail, about more than 70% of the jail uh, population has a, a serious mental illness. About 96% are pretrial detainees. And before we filed this uh, class action lawsuit that was recently certified, okay. <laughs> um, uh, ACJ has had the worst use of force record out of all 67 jails in Pennsylvania. <coughs> in 2000, 15, there were 414 use of force, and by 2019, there were 720. Use of the strength here went from 184 uses in 2015 up to 339 times in 2019. Um, so, I think there's a little kind of background sound. I don't know if you guys are getting that. If you're not, I'm okay. So, we decided that we were going to investigate the situation and determine whether we were going to file a class action lawsuit. In order to do that, we did hundreds of interviews with pretty much anyone we could speak to at the jail and speaking to uh, also their friends and families to get their accounts. And while we, um, with interviewing all these witnesses, we tried to incorporate as much as we put into the, uh, the complaint. And then what we are having is we work with also other organization groups to use to, to use what happened to try to further educate the community about what was going on at the jail. And what happened was that served as the basis for a referendum to ban solitary confinement and certain uses of force uses of certain weapons, such as the restraint chair and chemical agents. And that referendum ended up passing in May of 2021, and that would not have happened if, we, if it had just been a lawsuit. The whole point is the community felt very connected at the moment because organizers went door to door to educate people about here's what's happening at the jail. And at the same time, and what's always been my policy is, if I'm speaking to someone at the jail and they're suffering from whatever condition it is, the use of force condition, it's the food, um, it, I'm not getting uh, my med medicine, uh, I'm not getting uh, proper hygiene products. If that person feels comfortable, then I, I connect that person I, either with an organization or also with journalists. Journalists, you know, who have been vetted and who trust and people who would not try to take advantage of them. Because everyone has agency and I never see myself as the keeper or the gatekeeper of stories or anything. It's up to the person if they want to share their stories or not. And in addition to kind of educating us, <coughs> educate other people in the community about what was going on at the jail. Because at the end of the day, when you have more than 70% of the population voting on it, you're, you have a huge affected population, but you also have a number of people who are, have just have ignored the situation or just not been aware of it. And that was part of the job is to how do you educate people about it. And that's going on the radio, having news reports about it and letting the people who have been affected to tell those stories, not, oh, I'm the lawyer and I'm going to tell you the story about this person. <laughs> and I think because of that, that led to the referendum passing. Now, we certainly have had problems with the um, enforcing the solitary confinement ban. But one of the things I am very happy to say is whenever I talk to you know, my clients or the people at the jail, who have been in the restraint chair to be able to talk with them and say, do you know how many people have been in the restraint chair this year? Zero. Do you know how many people are gonna be in that restraint chair next year? None. You know how many of you are after that? None. And after that, none. And that's because you guys 
it stood up, I mean, to take that amount of courage, especially when there's a threat of real retaliation, and to talk about what you're experiencing. And that's the, <laughs> that's the definition of courage and bravery right there. The other example where uh, we're organizing very well um, kind of came right after this. So we banned all these uses of uh, types of weapons at the jail. So our warden then decides, okay, well let's then hire someone who's like this kind of mercenary militaristic contractor to come in and teach our officers on how to use unconstitutional force. And it's not just me saying, oh, it's unconstitutional force. That's the Department of Justice who made that finding. Uh, uh, expert in use of force who found those practices actually led to the death of someone uh, with a serious mental illness in the jail because the officers weren't trained on how to use you know, de-escalation tactics. So you choose the absolute wrong person to come in and to train. And our fear is as soon as that gets into the jail, we will not be able to get that out. And do we have time to file like a preliminary injunction on this? No. And we had at the time a, uh, well we still do, a jail oversight board. So <coughs> what happened is and we work with many different organizations to, you know, expose and educate, I would say, about who this contractor was and these companies and how they harmed other people for the people who are currently being impacted to talk about how, like, what the fear and the risk that they're now, risk of harm that they're going to be living in and their loved, loved ones to talk about that. It, and talk about the other problems with about the jail that had been, go, had been going on and still hadn't been addressed. And by that real public outpouring and the media attention, we were able to get the contract rescinded. And now that, <laughs> now that, now, and what was one of the best things about it, it didn't just ban this bad actor. It was to ban other trainers who would use similar use of force techniques. Because as we know, that's how the system works. It's like, oh, well, you, you mentioned A, but you didn't mention B. Oh, you call it solitary confinement, but we call it RHU, or we call it DHU, or we call it salami, I don't know, but <laughs> alphabet soup, whatever you want to call it. So it, we wouldn't have gotten there if we had been working with you know people who were affected by this. Um, and the community and the organizers. And in terms of what did it work out is I think with the COVID litigation, we also had a COVID class action and we tried to get, um, while litigation was pending, we tried to try, try to get universal testing at the jail and we tried to go through the oversight board. But I think because we weren't, weren't working with the community at that point, we weren't really organizing about that and we didn't, think about it in the same way, that we couldn't ha get all eyes on what was going on at the jail. Um, you know, fortunately, we were able to get the testing through litigation, but I think it's just a reminder is, you know, early and often, <laughs> always, you know, always look to your organizers and your community early and often um, to see if, what are the possibilities. Like I you know, said, like, is there a way that we can say yes here? Can we look for a way to find yes? Thank you. Um, those are all incredible stories. Um, this question is directed towards Inez, um, or is for Inez. Um, I think something that everybody has touched on in depth is the importance of organizing and movement building um, and how when you are a movement lawyer, sort of um, putting that organizing first, what are the skills or behaviors or practices that you believe are essential to successful organizing, movement building, and being part of a movement, and specifically certain things that lawyers might not think about? So... impacted people. That's the whole answer right there. Um, when your opposition has more money, 
you need more people. And if you are movement lawyering, if you are organizing, your opposition has more money. So that means that you need more people. That is literally the only way to combat it. So I think for me in St. Louis, the focus is really, it, it starts grassroots with going out and finding the people or, I mean, really, we don't have to go out and find the people because we're a nonprofit, holistic legal advocacy organization. So our client base are the very people that I'm talking about. It's the poor people. It's the black people. It's the members of the LGBTQ community that are being discriminated against. It's the unhoused community, so on and so forth. Um, so listening to those stories first, asking them, what is it, like, what is justice for you in this situation? And then trying to say yes and go and get it. Um, but then it's just the movement building. And that requires the hard, not so glamorous work of trying to figure out, okay, where are the most impacted people going to be for this specific cause? And then literally going out and knocking every single door seven times, because that's how many times it typically takes to move a person from inaction to action. It takes seven touches. So that may be a combination of seven door knocks, phone calls, text, whatever. But it generally requires about seven touches. And then the next step, and I think the most important part of organizing, is probably the storytelling. I have told my story 3,000 times, at least, at least. I don't have time to go into my story today, but you know, come to my TED Talk or something and you'll be able to hear my story. But um, I strongly believe that if you break a person's heart, you can then pour information into them over and over and over again. Just keep pouring that information. Once their heart is broken open, once you see that single tear slide down their cheek, you've got them. Now is the time to give them all the information that you are wanting to pour into them. I would tell folks the story about I got involved in the criminal legal system because my ex-husband picked up a hot skillet off of a stove and burned me all over my body with it. And what happens when you take your four kids and you leave a domestic violence situation? What happens when you can't afford your $1,600 a month in childcare and how you choose to commit a crime in order to afford that childcare instead of going back to the man who picked up a hot skillet off of a stove and burned you all over your body with it. So once I started telling people that story and people were like, damn, that's really fucked up. And then I start saying, what I needed was help. I made $57 too much to qualify for childcare assistance, which is what I needed. The reason why the city of St. Louis couldn't afford to help me when I made $57 too much is because we're spending $16 million on this jail, or we're spending over $200 million on St. Louis Metropolitan Police Department that kills more people per capita than any other police department in the entire country. So I told my story, dozens of others told their stories, and that started to change the hearts and minds of the people <clears throat> in St. Louis. So I think the short answer is people. The number one thing you need in organizing is people, and then you need your storytelling, and if you can effectively tell the stories of impacted people, well, not if you can effectively tell the story. If impacted people can effectively tell their stories, it will force change. Um, because nothing changes until we are all aware of what is happening. And my job is to make sure that everyone is aware of what is happening so that we can then do something about it. Can I just add, add one thing? Because what I said is it's so important about 
impact the people telling their stories because when they tell their stories, then the other person is not so much, well, why do you need this? Why do you need this? I need a better explanation for, this. they understand, they, they get it. it, it, it so, you know, so often if you, have, if you have the lawyer go in and say, oh, well, this is a great reason to do this because it'll help with taxes or uh, you know, solitary confinement is not shown to help with you know, safety you know, in any sort of means whatsoever and actually increases you know, violence. It's like, it's, it, then, then you get into all these whys and you don't need the whys. You just need to hear the story from the people who have been affected and who can tell, tell those like so eloquently because they've lived it. They're subject matter experts. I'm a subject matter expert on the criminal legal system. I'm a subject matter expert on the ways in which cash bail are unconstitutional and harmful. I'm a subject matter expert on black mold, rats, roaches, toilets that don't flush and showers that don't work. And so it's very, very difficult to, for elected officials to stand against you when you're a subject matter expert, because that's the thing that you're gonna come up against. You're gonna come up against elected officials saying, and I'm, this literally happened. I had an elected official tell me after I testified at a public safety hearing committee about my experience in the workhouse, and she came back and said, well, the workhouse can't be that bad because my mom used to be a prison guard, and I used to roller skate around the jail when I was a kid. It's like, ma'am, why are you lying? First of all, why are you lying? And you've never spent a night in the workhouse, so how can you tell me, someone who has spent 30 consecutive nights in the workhouse, whether or not there's rats and roaches or women ha are being told we don't have any more pads, so roll up some tissue and make do, or watching women, women pick roaches out of their food. How can you stand against that? You can't, you just end up looking foolish. So storytelling and understanding that impacted people are subject matter experts on whatever the thing is, and as lawyers, Everybody knows you go out and you get your forensic expert, you go out and get your different experts. I am an expert. You should be using me as if I am an expert on this subject, because I am. Thank you so much to all of you. Um, I just wanted to, so since we're running out of time, we have about two minutes um, before we're gonna open it up to questions. Do any of you have anything else you'd like to add in closing before we turn to questions? Um, I can. Uh, so all of us tonight are obviously very interested in criminal legal transformation and abolition um, in this context. But for those, and frankly, I think it's the most important work. Um, <coughs> I think prison work, working with people who are experiencing incarceration is going to, has been the major civil rights issue of past decades, and people are going to start realizing it soon. Everyone's focusing on the cops, and, and soon they'll realize, in my opinion, the drivers of the system are the facilities where we can disappear people. Um, but that, to be a movement lawyer, you don't need to do prison work. Um, you can, there are many other options for, for ways to plug in, and, and it's important to find the issues that you're really passionate about. Advancement Project runs the Police Free Schools campaign nationwide and are working on getting cops out of schools and supporting um, educational rights for black and brown kids across the country. Other places are doing a lot of housing justice and, and different kind of like housing land trusts and stuff like that. I know Public Justice Center in Baltimore does a little bit of that, more impact lawyering than movement lawyering, but um, there are ways to plug in here and, um, and find your path. and. I took a very traditional legal path to get here. I clerked, worked at, well, not very traditional. I took a more traditional than most. Clerked, worked for a police brutality boutique, worked at a big plaintiff's firm, and then got into it. Um, you don't need to come out of the gate doing it, but you do need to be able to show your passion and, and what you really care about. <coughs> Start now with your classes, with your extracurriculars, with your writing assignments, um, and do your political education. If you don't know who Miriam Kaba and Ruthie Gilmore are, figure it out, ASAP. Um, read Robin D.G. Kelly, read, um, I mean, there's just so many. Um, 
Kianga Yamada Taylor is, is excellent. Uh, Joy James um, develop a, under, an analysis of racial justice and abolition and transformation and start dreaming of the world that you want to see. You don't need to have all the answers, but you do need to have hope and you do need to have a drive for a better world. And you can do all of that now. Um, but do not neglect your political education if it's something you want to do. That's going to be really important to you, to supporting the, the organizations that you're working with in the community, to changing hearts and minds, to sharing narratives and stories and figuring out what framing you need, to talking to judges and you know, city council members. Um, so do not neglect that part of the work. And you can do that now. And you can also petition TED to do a whole class on it. If you guys already don't have it, you should. Um, like I said in the beginning, like, choose to use your powers for good. Um, now listen, I understand student loans are a bitch. I get it. But also, choose to use your powers for good. Being a lawyer, having that knowledge, that skill set, um, there is a reason lawyers can charge thousands of dollars an hour, why freedom is like, it's priceless. Um, so you using those skills, um, Mary Hooks is an organizer in Atlanta and she has this quote that I love coming back to because I think it's so applicable in so many pieces of our lives. Um, her specific quote was a mandate for black people to like, I, I don't want to get it wrong, but it's like, uh, I'm sorry, it's slipping my mind. It's basically be willing to be transformed in the service of the work. Um, so I think as lawyers, having this useful skill, allow yourself to be transformed in the service of the work. Like earn the respect of future generations by being in service of the work that needs to be done. Look around. Like we don't have to live like this. We truly do not have to live in a place that incarcerates more people than any other country on the planet where more black and brown people die at the hands of fatal state violence than any other country where we have unhoused people and we have children living in poverty and people not having access to food, people being evicted. Like we do not have to live this way. We really don't. All we have to do is decide that no more, we don't want to do this, we're going to do this a different way. And so part of the way that we can do that is every one of us, regardless of if we're a lawyer or a former nurse or whatever, decide that we want to be transformed in the service of the work. We want to be a servant for humankind, for mankind, for the people, for the people we love, for the communities we live in, for our children, all of these different things. Use this skill that you're acquiring to be in service of humanity. Because again, we don't have to live like this. In addition to everything that Miriam said, read everything you can get your hands on by Miriam Kaba, by Ruth Wilson Gilmore, by Andrea Ritchie, by, and I could literally just go on and on and on. Read everything you can. Make sure you have a strong analysis of what is happening. I think when we're in university, when we're in law school, when we're in whatever, we tend to be in a bubble. I need you to work, actively work, to get outside of that bubble to go into impacted communities, to talk to people, to find out what is going on, what, regardless of what kind of privilege you have over here. Get out of that bubble. Get out of that bubble and dedicate yourself to being in service of other people. Um, I, I think the, the last thing I would say to add is just I'm so encouraged by how many people have come out today 
I, my, I can't see, but in my mind, I, I'm assuming that this there's like 500 people in this audience. <laughs> <laughs> I am just ecstatic at the moment. Um, <clears throat> yeah, movement, movement learning can be trying sometimes, but just remember your motivation for why you got into it. And if you ever, you know, are questioning, am I, you know, am I going the right way about this? Am I, am I just, how, how am I interacting with the others? If the answer is I am using someone else as a prop, then I would strongly encourage you to rethink, you know, your approach at that point. One of the greatest things we can do is by our work, we can help to further add legitimacy to what is going on uh, in these places that have no transparency. The reports on the news, that makes other people believe what is, what is going on, makes the others. And a lot of the people that we interact with have so long in their lives been, been told, oh, you're, you're just lying, I don't believe you. You said that happened, that could have never happened. And part of our job is, is to help equip these individuals as best as we can so they can tell their, tell their stories and you know, strive towards like a you know a solution that they are interested in. So just keep that in mind. And again, thank you guys for coming tonight. Can I give that quote? I want to make sure because I love Mary Hooks, and she would be upset if I messed this up. Um, Mary Hooks articulated a mandate. This one is specifically for Black people, but I think it can be applicable to everyone. The mandate is to avenge the suffering of our ancestors, earn the respect of future generations, and be willing to be transformed in the service of the work. I feel like that's applicable to everyone, right? Thank you so much. What a beautiful note to end on. Thank you, Ines. So we're going to open it up for questions. So if folks just want to raise their hands. And while you guys are coming up with your brilliant questions, um, you know, I and probably my other panelists, but I'm not going to volunteer them, are always available to talk through some of these issues outside of the session. I'm happy to give out my contact information and, and find times to chat more. Same. Um, so are there any, this is a nationwide issue, but are there any particular states that are particular problems? It seems like Missouri, I, we hear so much about it in the news, is... I don't even claim the them. state of Missouri. It's... <laughs> I'm from St. Louis, USA, if anyone asks. <laughs> All of them. And one of the things that you learn when you do political education is that state, good states like New York and California do some pretty fucked up shit too. Um, there is a need everywhere. Um, and so you don't feel like you need to go to the worst of the worst. Your own backyard has problems that you can help out with. Feel free to come to Missouri. We'll take all the help <laughs> we can get. Yes. Don't tell anybody I accidentally claim Missouri. Our city defenders is in St. Louis. We take interns of all kinds, um, especially for the summer. So, like, if you want to see what the bowels of hell look like, um, that's not St. Louis, not but that is Missouri. So, um, we've got folks in St. Louis um, at Arch City who are doing statewide work around prisons, but we also do a little bit of everything. We are a holistic legal advocacy firm, so we have lawyers, we have social workers, we have comms department, we have the organizing department that I am in charge of. If you want to come organize, s send me an email. Absolutely. I will put you to work. I am also regularly, when they come across my plate, sending Arlene and folks here different positions and internships that seem interesting. So check in with them. Feel free to reach out to me. I can try to forward you stuff that comes along. Um, there are a lot of places. Abolitionist Law Center, AP. Um, gosh, I should know more of these off the top of my head, but I do not. Um, where you can do really, really good stuff. She already said Abolitionist Law Center. <laughs> yeah, there, there are a lot, a lot of great, great, uh, great firms and organizations to work with. And one thing is also the whole good state, bad state is, remember, there's a lot of underreporting going on. So we don't know how bad things are in certain places. So yes, you are needed everywhere. Another thing to think about is to, instead of going to a legal organization in an internship, 
maybe go to an organizing organization. There's, um, I think, what is it, like Mississippi Workers Justice Center, something like that. Um, I walk the Incarcerated Workers um, Organizing Committee. Um, they could, would love to have a lawyer or someone with some legal training, and you're going to get direct contact with folks who are directly impacted and really understand what's going on. I think those types of things are, are transformative when you think about your career and how you can plug in. Awesome, thank you. Um, I think we have time for one more question. recommendations as a good starting point, maybe like a book or documentary or something to get us started? Um, the authors we mentioned are pretty prolific, but you can pick up any of their stuff, uh, anything. Miriam Kava came out with a new book about two years ago that's a lot of essays. Um, Haymarket Books and AK Press put out a ton of really great stuff, all of which is great. Um, Micah Herskin has a uh, somewhere posted, maybe it's on Twitter or something, a list of like abolitionist resources. Um, AP put out somewhere, the website at AP is absolutely horrific. Apologies, but there's this thing called mapping, I think it's called mapping injustice. And there's a whole reading list that comes with that. Um, it kind of depends on what you're interested in or if you're interested in abolition, if you're interested in you know, bail work, all of which goes together. If you're interested in the development of racism in America, um, there's a great article by Barbara Jordan. Um, it is really daunting to start, and my organization gave us political, uh, yeah, uh, professional development funds, and I literally one year spent a thousand dollars on books, and I now have stacks in my house that I will never get to read, but I'm going to do my darndest. Um, I ask you, did you make your way through? I don't know. That's part of my fun employment. Um, any of them are good. Um, even just, I, actually, a really great place to start is the New York Times article on Ruthie Gilmore. Um, I think that's a, a really nice, accessible primer that I, I, I have heard Golden Gulag, her main book is really intense, so don't start there. Um, follow Miriam Kaba on Twitter, that's where she's most active. Um, interrupting criminalization um, on Twitter. They are constantly putting out articles, reading lists, things like that. Miriam Kava's book, <clears throat> two years ago, We Do This Till We Free Us, is a really good read. I started my abolition reading with Asada, um, her book, and um, the civil rights move, Ella Baker and the civil rights movement, I think is also a nice low stakes kind of primer to kind of get you, your mind in the right frame as you're starting to think about these really big things. Joy James has... Um series of lectures or podcasts or something in that ilk um, that are all excellent. Um, and she, some of the stuff she talks about, I think, is like, you can kind of put it on as a podcast and go for a walk. And that's a great way to start absorbing some of that. I think she's an excellent thinker. Oh, Derricka Purnell. My former colleague. I know Derricka. Derricka was, I was one of the people, she was like, we should abolish jail. She came to St. Louis and when I was first getting started in the campaign, and she was like, we should abolish jails. And I was like, but what about the rapists and the murderers? Which is what we always, what people always say when we say we want to abolish jails and prisons. The rapists and the murderers are cops. Yeah. And Derricka's answer when I said, well, what about the rapists and the murderers? She said, well, we should stop creating them. And I, like my mind kind of blew a little bit, like, holy shit, yes, we should. So I think uh, Derricka's book is Becoming Abolitionist, um, which I think is also a really, a really good start. And I'm happy to share some of the lists that I've collected. I will 
figure out where I moved in when I stopped, left my job, but get my contact info, I can send some stuff. Yeah, that, I think that was the entire list. <laughs> every book, we named every book. <laughs> we, uh, yes, all, all, all the ones, all the single ones. Uh, but uh, I'd like to also read anything uh, like with jailhouse lawyers as well. Um, I, I think that helps with the perspective. Even I think UCLA Law recently put out a, a publication just on the jailhouse uh, jailhouse lawyering. Um, so just to get yet yeah, another you know, perspective. There's an organization in DC called um, Free Minds. I think it's Free Minds Book and Poetry Club, but I always mess up the name. It works for those folks experiencing incarceration and publishes a lot of poetry. And you can volunteer virtually with them and help provide feedback on poems. So that's a another great avenue in line with what Jackie just said. One more thing. Um, hell is a very small space. Um, it's a collection of essays from people who have been held in solitary confinement. In, I believe, Pelican Bay, there's some stories from some folks um, that were held in Rikers and some other notorious prisons, I think, it, it's one of those, again, like break your heart open and then you can receive a whole bunch of information that I think was, I was already an abolitionist when I read it, but if I wasn't already an abolitionist, I would have become one after reading that book. Go to the Legacy, um, the Lynching Memorial and the Legacy Museum, is that what they call them? Yeah. That EJI um, has in Montgomery. Go to the um, Freedom Riders Museum. That I think is a great. I'm ignoring this. Real trip. Yeah. Oh, uh, worse than slavery. Another, another, another must read. Yeah, and if you, if people think that prisons are not modern day encapsulations of slavery, Google pictures of Angola right now. Today, there are black men working the fields picking cotton and tobacco with white overseers on horseback. And those are like, those are kind of the kernels. Some of the kernels you'll see at the EJI. Museum. How appropriate that Louisiana was the only state of the five states that had slavery on yeah. the ballot. They're the only yeah. ones that said, no, we want to keep slavery. Actually, what I heard is that some of the organizers pulled back because the ramifications of the way the bill got drafted um, would have allowed for slavery in jails and not just prisons. I, I haven't looked into it, but complex issues come up. Yes. We are at time, but I just wanted to thank all of you for joining us today. It was awesome to hear all of your amazing stories and the incredible work that you're doing. We could give all of our panelists a round of applause. <laughs>